Hello there and welcome to the Second Life Book Club. My name is Draxter Dupre. On the show today, Ken Liu, author of sci-fi and fantasy. Yes, both kinds. Both kinds of music, as they say in country and western. I will introduce Ken in just a few minutes. He is not only a veteran of the book club. We just found out off the air that his Second Life account is actually 14 years old. So he might be the uh, oldest person in the room today. First, a few bits of housekeeping. Most of you know this already. The book club island is open 24-7. We meet here every Wednesday at 12 o'clock for the main show. We also have the Mystery Hour with Con Sweeney once a month on Mondays. And we stream this live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to a combined audience of over 3,000, which for a book lover like myself is really uh an encouraging an encouraging message in these dire times people do apparently read or at least they watch avatars talk about books now if you're watching this and have not read anything lately we do not discriminate against you you can come in here even if you have i don't know the last book you read was assigned to you in high school maybe it was Mo moby dick or whatever it was we are listed in the destination guide you will uh see newbies stumbling around please be nice to them be kind befriend them ask them uh how you uh, can help them and uh maybe recommend some books there's a group here you can suggest a show idea by sending me an email or an im we're booked now through july 2021 but you can always suggest authors there's a reading list from bookshop.org every week you can actually click on the book props around here and that will shoot you straight to the website the uh, bookshop.org reading list that I update every week. Big thanks to my team here. Strawberry Linden uh, is promoted to producer. Strawberry Linden, give her a big hand here in the chat, please. Strawberry Linden is running camera. And she's producing the show. Brett Linden uh, is also on board. He helps out with security and marketing. Patch Linden, the whole governance team, all the moles. Marianne McCann customized this venue kralos dresses up the avatars and of course big thanks to silas merlin who makes special swag and super custom avatars aj mcdowell made the custom second life book club uh mug now uh ken liu is my guest he's a speculative fiction author working in sci-fi and epic fantasy his latest book is the short story collection the hidden girl it has 19 stories came out this february and we actually talked about the hidden girl way back in sansar you know that immersive virtual reality thing and uh, ken was also on the very first show here at the book club in april he's a, law a lawyer i don't know if he's a former lawyer we'll find out he's a programmer he does all sorts of things he's no stranger to vr he's the inventor of silk punk i have no idea what that is it's a sub genre of something we'll find that out too and he has just recently announced that there is a deal in the works with AMC Television, makers of The Walking Dead, and they're developing an animated series based on a, a series of short stories that is in The Hidden Girl. Ken, thank you so much for coming back to the book club. Thank you, Drax, for having me back. It's, uh, how, it's a real pleasure to be back here. How does it feel with this avatar? Is that, uh, is that just uh, some old comfy clothes that maybe uh, smell a little bit? Uh, dusty but you're just getting <laughs> into them it, it feels pretty awesome i mean this is this is like the avatar that makes me feel truly at home it's it's so right it's very me why what wh wh why did you because when we first talk i find this fascinating we don't we don't have to uh you know harp on this for too long but uh why this avatar what's the what's the significance of this avatar for you when you first came in because so this one is, my... is a nice yeah go ahead yeah, so my, my first collection is called The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories. And if you um, have the cover of that around, then you can hold it up, show people. Um, it's got a an origami paper tiger on top. And so that image sort of became associated with me. Um, I, I put it on my business card, and it's sort of um, uh, all around uh, became sort of my avatar in real life, if you will. Uh, and so um, when, you know, when... We were talking about having me on the show here. I was like, well, let's you know figure out how to do an avatar. I mean, 
my account was so old and I hadn't logged in for so long that when I logged in, I was literally a ghost. They 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 did not have a um, they couldn't even show me. I was I was just a ghost. Uh, and uh, so you had to make an avatar for me. And um, uh, we went around uh, a few different things. And I thought the this tiger cowboy is just perfect. Uh, it's got the tiger thing going on, and it's got the cowboy because a lot of my um, stories, especially in the first collection, uh, all the flavors was about um, you know it's uh, in the genre of weird west. Uh, it's a mm-hmm. it's a western, but with weird fantasy sci fi elements to it. That's um, and so you know, here we are. Uh, I am the tiger cowboy. This is really cool. All I have to say is that you now have to print new business cards with this avatar on it, and I want I I want to oh see them. And when we meet in the physical realm, when this pandemic is over, then uh, I'm looking forward to these business cards. It's it, it, speaking of the pandemic. That's a that's another basic question I I like to uh, start with. Is the pandemic how is it treating you in terms of? Um, productivity and creativity i mean it really runs the gamut people say oh wow i do have more time yes but i have so much more anxiety that it's really useless or i'm boarded up with with my loved ones who are still my loved ones but at the same time i kind of want to kill them so i'm thinking about ways of killing them uh, and i'm not uh, you know a crime writer so uh, how how is that for you right now uh it how do i even describe this uh it 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 there it's like a roller coaster i guess that's the best thing to say yeah. about it um most of it is down uh in the terrifying falling stage uh now it's sort of like uh maybe on a smaller loop the loop not not as bad as the first one but still terrible um let me see uh how i can describe this uh so for four month or so um between march and much of june um I was unable to do anything productive. I, I couldn't write at all. I mean, I had all these deadlines, but nothing. I, I got nothing done. Um, the if I could answer a few emails uh, per day, I felt like I was having a good day. Um, I mean, just getting the kids fed and uh, doing the dishes was, you know, made me feel productive. Uh, anything more on top of that is just a bonus. Wow. Um, and then eventually, late June, it um, got to the point where um, you know things could not go on uh, uh, that way because I had been telling my publishers that I needed more time, I needed more time, and eventually they were like, "Well, you know, you you you, you got to do something." Uh, and uh, and I was like, "Yes, it's 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 true. I mean, you know, I I couldn't keep on." saying i needed more time i mean eventually you have to actually do something so um i tried to write um in late june early july and it was um it was torture uh mm-hmm. i had never in my entire career had so much trouble getting words out it was unbelievable um every i mean you know the reason it's so hard is because i write a lot about the near future and mm-hmm. despite you know what drax you you might think uh from the stories i'm actually an optimist uh but the pandemic really sort of struck a very deep blow um, to my faith in humanity. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a very common trope in science fiction, especially, is this idea that people around the world will come together um, when there's a common threat, uh, whether it's aliens or some sort of virus or, uh, heck, climate change. <laughs> um, and the reality is, of course, that is exactly the opposite um you know when i when i wrote mano no Aware, which is one of my earlier stories about asteroids coming to strike the earth um i wrote about how all the countries instead of coming together actually started trying to you know fight each other mm-hmm. um which a lot of people said that seems completely unrealistic uh now i have to say um i was right <laughs> but Ken, who wrote Mano no Aure, was right. If if there were an alien invasion or asteroids coming now, that is exactly what would happen. People would not come together. Uh, anyway, that aside, um, I I couldn't I couldn't write uh, for for much of of, of that time. I, I couldn't write. Um, and and when you're trying to write about the near future, when when you're going through something like this, it's impossible. I mean, how how can you write about the near future when? this is all happening uh i i couldn't write anything 
at all. I couldn't even envision what the world would be like in a, in a way that I felt believable in five years, much less, you know, 10, 15. So what ended up getting me out of this was uh, what, at the time, I thought of it as a very normal choice. But in retrospect, it seems very sci-fi, I guess, the way I got out of my um, rut. Um, so deadlines were piling up. I had less than two weeks to produce a story that was due. I could not get another uh, extension. I mean, I could, but I had already begged for extension so many times. I felt so embarrassed about doing it again that that I just vowed to myself I would not do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I said, okay, I simply cannot seem to get any words out of the word minds. Um, I need to. I need to do something. Um, I need to. Uh, I need to try something. Um, maybe, maybe here's what I'll do. Um, I had been interested in machine learning for the longest time. Uh, and then I said, okay, my brain is incapable of writing anything right now. Maybe if I can train a neural net on my own fiction uh, for the entirety of my career, maybe Robo Ken will be able to actually generate some story or story oh my ideas. God. I, if I can do it, maybe Robo Ken can do it. You know, this is literally one of the oldest tropes in sci-fi where, you know, even it's, it's just yeah. even in Calvin and Hobbes where, you know, you can do it. So you're like, okay, let's, let's, let's train a machine, a robot to do it. So I said, okay, that's what I'll do. Um, uh, so I ended up installing, um, um, uh, TensorFlow and Terrace and all this stuff onto my machine. Um, uh, I don't have a, <laughs> I don't have a good graphics card as, um, probably was revealed. I'm, I'm just, I'm actually very behind technologically. I'm not, I don't have a good graphics card. I, I don't have a good gaming rig or anything like that. So I knew it was going to be slow and, and I can't do anything too, too impressive. So I built a fairly simple neural network. Um, it's a LSTM um, architecture for people who are geeks. It's the long short-term memory. Um, uh, it's, it's a very old architecture, but it works particularly well for- Hold on, for the generation. people who are not geeks, then you basically put put your stories, you feed your stories to this yeah, yeah, machine. Yeah, yeah, I can describe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's very cool. So you start this out with a neural network yeah. that basically knows nothing about language. It literally knows nothing. And the way you feed it, you don't even feed it words. You feed it streams of characters. Um, it has no concept of words. It has no concept of sentences. has no concept of language, really. You just feed it the entire corpus of, of, um, of whatever you want to train it on. And I was very concerned about you know, uh, originality, plagiarism, and all this stuff. So I made a decision early on that unlike some other experiments in this realm where people would train it on, you know, golden age science fiction or, you know, train it on Wikipedia or whatever, I trained it only on my own fiction. Uh, that is it. That's the entirety of what it knows. Wow. Um, I fed it these streams of characters uh, and then taught the network over time to... Uh, see the patterns in these letters to to predict the letter that would come after a stream of letters. Uh, and then I kept on doing this, running it over and over again, uh, doing um, uh, the the uh, following the gradient. This is like I was like, this is so cool. I'm I'm using my high school calculus again. Like my multi variate calculus uh, has not been. Uh, I haven't used that in I, I don't know 20 years. Uh, but you know, for the first time, my 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 partial derivatives and gradients are working again. You know, I'm actually oh, can, can I don't mean to stuff. can I I don't mean to interrupt you, but I need to say this: this is the most high level procrastination that I've ever heard of. If, <laughs> when I procrastinate, you know, I basically take a pencil and I outline little things on a thing, or I clean my my carpet off the dog fur. But you uh, program an AI to write stories. Wow. Uh, you, you you speak the truth though. It was it was really just high level uh procrastination. That's what it was. Um but anyway, I, I let the I, I let the network RoboKen, and that's that's what I named it. I let RoboKen <laughs> run on my computer uh for about three days uh, until the loss function um brought it down to a level where I felt like it could generate some stuff. I mean, this is kind of amazing. I mean when I started, and then I fed it a few keywords to see, you know, what kind of thing would babble out. My, my idea was just like, I can't write 
the story. So I'm going to feed the prompt that I was supposed to write to to this network and see what RoboKen will come up with. Um, and I, I have to say, it's 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 kind of amazing. I mean, this is this is a thing that anybody who's done machine learning uh, now finds old hat. But to me, it's just amazing because again, this network knew nothing. It, it knew <laughs> it knew and it still knows nothing about language, about words, about sentences, about anything. About pacing and or about sort of dramatic structure and stuff. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. uh, all, all it ever got to learn were these streams of letters and punctuation marks and spaces. And nonetheless, it's able to generate pretty coherent sentences. I mean, it is amazing to me. I mean, I think this is like one of the biggest breakthroughs in machine learning the last decade or and a half or so, which is um, even these very seemingly primitive techniques can produce amazing results when given enough data. And I apparently had produced enough fiction to provide a corpus that was actually, you know, pretty, pretty uh, capable of training the network to do this. So I started babbling stuff. And, and I have to say, it was, it was some crazy, interesting stuff. It, it did not sound exactly like me. But but I could see that the ideas it came up with were the sort of things I would be interested in. Um, some of the sentences were barely on the verge of making sense. Other sentences were actually kind of neat. I mean, I, I read it and I'm like, that actually seems kind of interesting as an idea for a story. So I just I just kept on doing it. Wait, 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 wait. But you're saying that that uh, that what you have produced is fascinating, but it's nowhere near uh, something that you can actually publish. Uh, well, I was <laughs> right. Uh, it did not because I saw level. I I saw a video, and maybe people here in the audience know it too. It was written up in all the big big uh, tech blogs of a of a short film that was made based on a script that was written by an AI that was fed like a bunch of uh, you know uh, famous sci fi movies, and and so, and a, a, sm a small team of independent filmmakers made a a pretty you know uh, high production value short film out of it it's absolutely bizarre because the dialogue is completely bizarre and that's the, it floats around somewhere on youtube i i have to look it up but um uh, go ahead ken well uh, uh yeah i mean i i knew that my little neural network was not going to be anywhere near the really impressive stuff like gpt3 or anything like that so so it couldn't possibly have generated stuff that really was publishable. Um, you know, GPT-3 could actually write blog posts that will get voted into number one on Hacker News. Uh, you know, that that's the sort of thing it's capable of. My my little neural network is absolutely not pop capable of doing anything like that. But but um, these story seeds were very good. They were very intriguing. I mean, it 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 was sort of like. I don't even know what this is. I guess the closest thing I can think of is is what the Dadaists used to do, where they would do all sorts yes. of weird automatic writing kind of things. But this is a little bit like that, except more, because in some ways was reflecting my own patterns of thinking and my own patterns of storytelling just echoed back in a really weird way. Um, and finally, I, I will say this, this is where it got to. Um, it actually did create uh, give me an idea for a story and I, I wrote it um, and I kept on using the neural network to generate sentences that would could be edited or sometimes not edited at all and just plopped into the story. Um, so I finally did finish writing the story and I turn it in uh, and uh, about 10% of the text in the final draft was actually written by RoboKen, not me. Um, so, you know, that's that's wow. Um, that's that's what I ended up uh, doing. So, uh, that is so, so that, wild. Yeah, it it worked. It worked for me. Uh, you know, I, I I wouldn't say this is uh, uh, this is what I would recommend for everyone to do, uh, but it did work for me. Here's a uh, Cayenne actually said here in the chat. Good idea, uh, generator brainstorming with yourself. And uh, Elfbiter says sounds like the digital version of cut up technique. The technique of cutting up your stories at Sai here in the chat and recombining for uh, something, and that's been around for a long time. This sounds like a next step in this process. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like it. I, I'm not familiar with the cut up uh, technique, but it does sound like very similar to this. This is a, like a digital version of that. Yeah. 
Now, uh, this this is a fascinating story, uh, Ken, and I'm I'm so glad that this pulled you out of this this writer's block, this rut. I mean, it's it's really brutal out there, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's 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 easy for us to say knowledge workers or people who are used to working from home, you know, nothing has changed for us, but. Um, the hardship is tremendous. And I also want to say for the record, I do feel that you are actually uh, putting forth uh, optimistic views. And and here in my run sheet, I have from The Hidden Girl, for example, uh, the, the stories here are um, fundamentally ho hopeful. And we're, we're going to get into them, but I just jotted down here, even the even the one on, um, on the school shooting. So let's talk a little bit about The, the Hidden Girl. The there is a wide variety of subject matters in this in this book. A lot has to do with people uploading their consciousness. So it's it's sort of post singularity, man machine is merging. Uh, people upload their their um, brains into the cloud. Uh, there is a story about a World War II era um, internment camp for Japanese Americans. Um, it's a story on on school shooting. And I want to briefly read uh, the preface of, of this book and then ask you um, about this. So let me briefly read here. You write in the book, there is a paradox at the heart of the art of fiction, at least if I, as I have experienced it, you. While the medium of fiction is language, a technology whose primary purpose is communication, I can only write satisfying fiction by eschewing the communicative purpose. As the author, I construct an artifact out of words, but the words are meaningless until they're animated by the consciousness of the reader. The story is co-told by the author and the reader, and every story is incomplete until a reader comes along and interprets it. And th this is so so great that you start this uh, you start this this compilation with this because uh, I was thinking like what what do you think is the percentage of the worlds that the re that the reader fills in with your stories, and also, is what is the common thread of the hidden girl, and is the common thread also something that you may intend, uh, or that that I sort of superimpose? Like for example, right now, everything that I read <laughs> has to do with neoliberalism, and that it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, this is but this is sort of my <laughs> obsession with like the nonfiction stuff that I read or the history now how. So that that ideology came about, and everything I'm reading, and I'm reading a lot of Larry, Larry Niven because Larry Niven, the you know living legend in sci-fi, is coming on on the show too. And I, I'm sure he didn't intend this, but I have to like everything. I'm sort of superimposing this on it. Um, what do you think is is the rough percentage of what what you put in and what the what the reader is putting in? You know, I'm I'm not sure there is a way to put a precise percentage on it, and I think it probably differs from reader to reader. Um, you know, for for readers who are very much on the same wavelength as me already, I would imagine that um, perhaps the amount that they have to put in to make the story work for them is less. Um, and for readers who are not, they would have to do a lot more work um, to make the story uh, work for them. So I think it differs from reader to reader and also differs from story to story. There are some stories where I do a lot more explaining and some stories where I'm just sort of like, it's a subtweet. Um, you know, you <laughs> either uh, are in it or you're not. Uh, you, you either can get it uh, uh, right away or you don't. And it's, it's just the way it is. But, um, but have I, I, you interacted like with a fan or, or you know at a, at a convention who came up to you and you and who told you an interpretation that you haven't thought of like where you oh, knew yeah, that this person yeah. you know he read that story but it's like as a just a completely that that you yeah. have would have never expected that that happens all the time, especially with some of the stories that are intended to be very open ended. Um, I mean, uh, cutting, which uh, is the last story. Ah, in the collection. I actually, yep. That that's an example of a story that is completely open. Uh, I mean, it's it's um, it, it feels sort of wrong to even say that it's it's intentionally that way because um, it's it's it, it's so open that I think the reader really does most of the work, um, no matter who the reader is. Uh, it really starts out with just a very small 
simple premise, almost um, a skeleton, um, just a, just a few lines on the page, um, and and really it's up to the reader to figure out if they want to play with this idea and fill it in and and make it say something. And I I know you know some readers just don't connect with it at all. They just don't see the point of it. But I've heard interpretations of that story that are just wild, um, which mm-hmm. you know is awesome because that's how I intend it to be. In terms cutting of cutting, is you're a great about, story. I was just going to say cutting for the people because we're talking about the hidden girl here. My guest is Ken Liu. If you're just tuning in uh, on the web and you're not here in the room, uh, shame on you. This is the elitist crowd here in the room. No, not shame on you. Come in next time. We'll we'll make the venue bigger so you can come in. Cutting is a story where there is a. Um, uh, a religious community, and they and their religious practice is to cut out uh, words from their from their holy text. So, so uh, their method of of becoming more spiritual is to is to thin out the text and make it arguably, I don't know, less coherent or maybe more open to interpretation. It's it's hey. a go ahead. Either either works for me. Um, I was just going to say that um, you asked earlier about, you know, whether there's some sort of overall theme that runs through the hidden girl as a whole. Uh, I think there is. Um, it's um, it's sort of uh, the dominant theme um, for maybe the last decade or so of of my career as a short fiction writer. Um, for much of that time, I'm very concerned with one thing, which is what does it mean to remain human um, in the face of cataclysmic change? Uh, the, the idea is that, you know, we're, we're living through a world in which there are just ever accelerating changes technologically, economically, socially, in every sense. Um, what does it mean to remain human? Um, and uh, is it actually based on some sort of fundamental set of values and 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 or is it really based on something that that's much harder to quantify more about the stories that we tell ourselves i mean one of the recurring concerns that i have is the idea that good stories are actually more important than good institutions mm-hmm. um and that i i, I think uh the the hidden girl especially the set of uploading stories are are really about that they're about how the stories we tell ourselves to make sense of the world and to make sense of our own lives is actually the most important thing. It's the thing that unites us. It's the thing that divides us. It's the thing that gives us our lives meaning. Uh, and in my view, you know, no matter how the world changes and how unrecognizable superficially the future becomes, the, the fundamental story um, that we tell ourselves about who we are and, and what, how we give meaning to abstract notions like justice, love, courage, um, that will not change. It's always going to be based on stories. I, I, I could not agree more. I could not agree more. And, and also what I think, uh, what, what the hidden girl is to me also, and I mean, I guess, I guess it's a subset in the, in the big umbrella that, that you put forth is, um, how, who are we on an individual basis? Can we escape, uh, how other people define us? I, I I mean th- yeah. I think that's a that's a through line too and and we because I interviewed you before as I mentioned um, and we touched on this uh, also this is also the story of of immigrants uh, coming from a culture yeah, yeah. culture A and going into culture B how much do I uh, assimilate how much do I absorb from this new culture how much do I retain from my culture there's a story one of my favorite stories in the hidden girl is memories of my mother it's a, it's the shortest one i think it's two and a half pages and, and my friends and here in the audience i talk about it often uh, my mother passed away when i was uh, 18 you know it was a long time ago and this story resonated with me uh, for that very reason where a mother who is terminally ill and she has two years to live and in your story there's a technology where she can sort of uh carve up these two years and she decides to visit her daughter as the daughter grows up right so she visits her every 17 20 years um to see how she is growing up and to meet her as a as a teenager um the mother falls ill when the when the girl is 10 
And then the mother comes back when she's 17, when she's 30, and when she's 80. And so uh, this this girl has the opportunity to interact with with her mother in this these different stages in life, and reacts in, with different uh, emotional states. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, premise. This story. I mean, I could I, I, we could talk about uh, hours for that for, uh, about that story, which also actually is a concrete question here, Ken. When you come up with an idea like this, this is a two and a half page story. Um, I ask this every author: How do you know that this story is a short story or a very short story, and not the basis for an entire novel or a series? How do you, how do you know um, this? You know, I, I'm not sure. You always know. I mean, I'll give you an example from my own career. That's probably the most extreme version of this. Um, if you've read my first collection, you'll know that that collection, The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories, starts with a short story, a very short story. It's called The Bookmaking Habits of Select Species. Um, and it presents a variety of ways. It's, a like, it's, it's written like a listicle. It's a variety of different ways that alien species might be imagined to create their own version of, of books and then how they um, uh, view language, communication, and, uh, you know, the vector space of all possible sentences differently than, than humans would. Um, and it's a very short story, maybe uh, four or five pages long. I think it's under 3,000 words. It's a very short, short story. Um, it might surprise some of you, or maybe not, uh, for those of you who actually read my uh, longer work, it might not surprise you that after I wrote that story, I, I sort of kept on thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. Um, and then I realized that the listicle form is perfect for one version of that story, but it is not the entire story. There's something about that idea that actually felt to me like it needed to be expanded in some sort of into a bigger thing. And uh, the thing that it ended up as is the Dandelion Dynasty. So mm -hmm. the uh, the one million word, uh, one million plus word epic fantasy shares the same foundational idea as uh, that 3000 word short story. Um, it's just that I believe that both ways of embodying the idea made sense um, because ultimately the Dandelion Dynasty is about communication, different ways of telling stories, different ways of embodying your story in a form that can be carried on across time and space to new peoples, new generations. Um, and then actually ended up being um, this, essentially the same core idea, but, but embodying a very, very different way with a great deal more complexity and, and, and uh, drama and you know um, everything else that goes with it. But mm -hmm. in some ways, if you want to play the game of you know teaching this to a neural network, I, I do believe that there's a version of a neural network that would read the two and then map them to the same space in oh, hundred-dimensional space. Right. Um, that the book making habits of select species and the Dan and Dynasty are actually the same story in this very extreme oh version. boy i'm looking forward to a time when when youtube has that algorithm and then goes like wait there is a there's some <laughs> copyright issues right here uh, uh ken liu you just plagiarized yourself why don't you give back x award uh, this award or that award <laughs> yeah exactly um but but anyway go, going back to another thing you said earlier about this whole notion of how how do we tell our own story when we're also trying to figure out to what extent we want to accept the stories other people want to tell about us. Yep. This is also a recurring theme in my work, the idea of stories other people tell about you versus stories you tell about yourself and yes. whether one is any more true than the other, or maybe you have to somehow figure out a way to make both true. Um, I think this is actually a, a, rep a representative of a particular problem I have with the way immigration is often talked about. I think in this country, especially in the U.S., when we talk about immigration, we're often talking about in the sense of it's about assimilation versus not assimilating, as though those are the only two binary choices yes. or as That's though nice. somehow that that axis of, of, of that dimension of looking at things is useful, or all encompassing or says everything that needs to be said. It, that happens to be the least interesting dimension of, of immigration for me. Um, I'm far more interested in the idea of um, immigration uh, as, a, as, a, as a way of evolving the stories of the culture you 
migrate to, as well as the culture you migrate away from. It's not about you. It's rather it's about how the collective story changes. I think we don't focus enough on how when people migrate across cultures, it's not, you know, we focus way too much on what happens to them. We don't focus nearly enough on the story, on the collective story of both the community that they depart from as well as the community they join and also the sense in which they integrate the communities or they change the stories both communities tell about themselves and i think that's actually far more interesting because cultures are not fixed things you know it's not like when you go from culture a to culture b somehow you have to decide between a and b a and b are both themselves things being defined by the very act of your own movement um, a and B are both collective stories being told by thousands of people at the same time, you yourself among them. So I'm far more interested in how the story of America changes by my participation in it and how the story of America changes by the participation of all those who come to it and all those who are born to it. Um, that to me is far more interesting than the idea of whether you're becoming more American or not, which to me is a nonsensical question. Actually, uh, wow, because I have here on my run sheet that we got to get to the reading. This is so fascinating. Can we could uh, talk for hours, but now I realize that maybe this is a good, good segue into uh, your reading of uh, um, of the Rebo uh, Reborn, yeah, uh, yeah which is in a way, I mean, kind of what you're talking about, because here and, and I'll let you set it up. I just wrote, uh, jotted down here in my notes that this is a story where. Aliens have uh, war in conflict with humans, but they there's some sort of armistice going on, and they're living side by side. But there is a technology where your entire memory can be wiped, and uh, this wiping of memory is usually done uh, with 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 criminals to reintegrate them into society. Uh, but uh, maybe you want to add something uh, to set this up, and I'll bring up the book stand here because this is kind of what you're talking about. Is is uh, the protagonist here, who is a um, a federal agent? We come to learn that um, that he has been uh, his memory has been wiped here and there, and uh, the aliens who coexist in this scenario with the humans, but ha were in conflict. They were invaders. And they were uh, here. Here we got the typical uh, SL book club, people falling off stage, kind of things. No problem. Yes, no problem. You, you do. You do. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna sorry. riff. I'm gonna riff. This is public access. Yeah, you, you keep on talking while I figure my way out back to so, where I need to be. So the reborn is post-invasion Earth, and what's here very interesting is there's a power dynamic. There's there's these aliens, the the Tovnin, and and they, uh, you know, I mean, on the surface they live uh, peacefully with. With humans, but they have this technology to completely erase your memory, and you're you're not really sure in in this story w w uh, how they actually go if they go about this responsibly. Um, and uh, of course, they make the argument that it's for your own good and all that. Uh, if you want to set it up a little bit more, uh, go ahead. If you don't want to spoil it, Ken, it's obviously your call. Uh, okay. Uh, what will we hear here, from you? I, I'll do a little bit of setup, and so you can sort of get a sense of what the opening of the story is about. So, um, the Reborn is uh, is a story that I wrote for Tor dot com, and it's a little unusual uh, in my in my work because I had to write the story based on um, uh, an image that they gave me from the start. Ah. The image is is not particularly um, a distinct. Uh, it's it's got a flying saucer on it, or at least as I interpret it. Um, and then so I sort of had to think about the story around that. And ultimately, it is a story about uh, uh, drugs, like you said. It's about alien invasion of Earth and post occupation Earth. Um, but of course, um, the aliens are are special because they have the unique ability to separate out historical crimes from the present. In their view. Uh, whatever you don't remember, you're not responsible for. So uh, their their view is this. Say you murder someone. If your mind is then wiped, you're literally a different person. Um, as a different person who has no memory of that act happening, how can you possibly be morally responsible for that? Um, this comes from the fact that they themselves are biologically 
built this way. They forget the older parts of themselves and their past as they move on. So even though they committed horrible atrocities against the humans during the conquest, they have forgotten about it. And in their view, they're no longer responsible for it. Um, and the fact that humans insist on the idea that those who, um, that in their view, the past versions of the aliens who did all these horrible things are somehow the same as the present versions of these aliens who are trying to live in peace with humans. In their view, this is a sign of humans' less evolved nature and our lack of moral and ethical, um, uh, you know, uh, growth. Uh, well, we humans just don't view it that way. And and the story starts out by um, by sort of describing what what that concretely means. I, I want to jump in here real quick and thank you for setting this up because this reminds me so much of a conversation I have often about reparations in the in the US and this can be applied to other discussions as well and when it happens so many times I bring up uh, reparations and then people say well I wasn't there I wasn't uh, guilty it was it's not my fault so they immediately jumped to that I mean, that that can be applied to the Nazi crimes in, in Nazi Germany as well and then when you put forward like uh, the notion of yes, I know that you were not there and you're not personally responsible. I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about healing. I'm talking about healing by acknowledging the the past. Uh, this is fundamentally different. Healing through knowing than healing uh, through uh, ignoring. So, anyways, go go ahead. This is okay. the re beginning of uh, the story, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, this is the very beginning of the story. Um, okay, and this is a. Fairly short excerpt, I think only about three, three minutes or so. The Reborn. Each of us feels that there is a single I in control, but that is an illusion that the brain works hard to produce. Steven Pinker, The Blank Slate. I remember being reborn. It felt the way I imagine a fish feels as it's being thrown back into the sea. The judgment ship slowly drifts in over Fan Pier from Boston Harbor, its metallic disc-shaped hull blending into the dark, roiling sky, its curved upper surface like a pregnant belly. It is as large as the old federal courthouse on the ground below. A few escort ships hover around the rim, the shifting lights on their surfaces sometimes settling into patterns resembling faces. The spectators around me grow silent. The judgment, scheduled four times a year, still draws a big crowd. I scan the upturned faces. Most are expressionless. Some seem odd. A few men whisper to each other and chuckle. I pay some attention to them, but not too much. There hasn't been a public attack in years. A flying saucer, one of the men says, a little too loud. Some of the others shuffle away, trying to distance themselves. Goddamn flying saucer. The crowd has left the space directly below the judgment ship empty. A group of Tannen observers stand in the middle, ready to welcome the reborn. But Kai, my mate, is absent. Thee told me that Thee has witnessed too many rebirths lately. Kai once explained to me that the design of the judgment ship was meant as a sign of respect for local traditions evoking our historical imagination of little green men and Plan 9 from outer space. It's just like how your old courthouse was built with that rotunda on top to resemble a lighthouse, a beacon of justice that pays respect to Boston's maritime history. The Tannen are not usually interested in history, but Kai has always advocated more effort at accommodating us locals. I make my way slowly through the crowd to get closer to the whispering group. They all have on long, thick coats, perfect for concealing weapons. The top of the pregnant judgment ship opens, and a bright beam of golden light shoots straight up into the sky, where it is reflected by the dark clouds back onto the ground as a gentle, shadowless glow. Circular doors open all around the rim of the judgment ship, and long, spraying lines unwind and fall from the doors. They dangle, flex, and extend like tentacles. The judgment ship is now a jellyfish drifting through the air. At the end of each line is a human, securely attached like hooked fish by the tannin ports located over their spines and between their shoulder blades. 
As the lines slowly extend and drift closer to the ground, the figures at the ends languidly move their arms and legs, tracing out graceful patterns. I've almost reached the small group of whispering men. One of them, the one who had spoken too loud earlier, has his hands inside the flap of his thick coat. I move faster, pushing people aside. Poor bastards, he murmurs, watching the reborn coming closer to the empty space in the middle of the crowd, coming home. I see his face take on the determination of the fanatic, of a xenophobe about to kill. The reborn have almost reached the ground. My target is waiting for the moment when the lines from the judgment ship are detached so that the reborn can no longer be snatched back into the air. The moment when the reborn are still unsteady on their feet, uncertain who they are. Still innocent. I remember that moment well. The right shoulder of my target shifts as he tries to pull something out of his coat. I shove away the two women before me and leap into the air, shouting, freeze! And then the world slows down as the ground beneath the reborn erupts like a volcano. And they, along with the town and observers, are tossed into the air, their limbs flopping like marionettes with their strings cut. As I crash into the men before me, a wave of heat and light blanks everything out. All right, so that's my reading selection. Ken, thank you. Thank this you. is Ken Liu uh, reading from the Reborn, and uh, obviously we're witnessing witnessing a terrorist attack uh, here with one of the the human protagonists uh, being uh, a federal agent, and it it gets. Uh, I mean, obviously we're not spoiling anything. It's it's pretty it's pretty twisted story. I mean, this could make. Uh, uh, quite the thriller. And again, at the core is this notion of um, can we move forward if we don't acknowledge the past and or how much of the past do we have to acknowledge in order to move forward? And more importantly, I think, Ken, here is also the who is in charge of controlling that, I think. I mean, it's like the, right. the power structure here is really it's very skewed. I mean, it's not like not everybody has has equal access to this um, to uh, yeah to 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 have the luxury to just move on without any historical context, and it benefits one group more than the other group. Mm -hmm. Like so many things in real life, it's yeah. I'm looking at the clock. We're we're counting down. We have to. Oh my god! This the time flies when you have when you have fun. This is the Second Life Book Club. And there's a bunch of uh, really great comments here. I'm going to step through them real quick. And uh, we probably have to skip one reading that's up, up to you, Ken. There's one reading uh, of one of the episodes that is going to be made into an animated program. And then there's another one. Uh, you be the judge. Let me look at we'll, some we'll of We'll do the short comments. one. Why don't we do the, we can do the short one from um, from the uploaded stories because I think from it'll the, be cool to talk about those. Yeah, perfect. Uh, here somebody says, uh, Wayo Mao says, the OA in your profile name, name does that stand for open-ended? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's one of the That's original certainly not but you know you know what I, I i like that i'm gonna go with it so if people ask me in the future that's what i'm gonna say <laughs> elf biter here has a good question this is now we're going to the next uh reading uh, elf biter says question would transhumanists allow other people remain human if they had the power again this is a question about the, the power structure here um yeah. doing things to people for their own good has historical precedence i'm scrolling through the comments here uh, the current thinking there probably would not be economical sense to create a new sentient species. Where would be the profit? So I'm just uh, reading here through comments without context, without historical context, just what the story is about. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> before we go to the uploaded stories, I just uh, want to briefly mention the the story thoughts and prayers, which I also find outstanding. And a quick comment from you, Ken. This is a story about a school shooting, and uh, in the aftermath, there's different perspectives of this shooting from the from the family, uh, the affected family, the victim's family, but also from a troll. And you end this with a troll and the troll who does uh, so-called, and I don't know if this exists in the real world, a rip, uh, RIP trolling, rest in peace trolling, where um, this troll harasses this family that is grieving, grieving uh, because of 
their their child being killed in this in this awful school shooting and basically the scenario here is that this family is going out there they're proactively communicating but they're being inundated with this harassment and we all know this phenomenon of um some folks pretending that there are crises actors that all these shootings are not real that that there's always the same people show up in the news reports alex jones from infowars is one of the the big pro- proponents of this of this crazy bs uh but in your story the troll uh defends himself by saying what he does is um he fights against inauthenticity so so my question in this current climate uh what this story is about the the discourse what do you do in a discourse when it's being hijacked by by really bad actors who are just there to uh to harass and then have the i mean in my mind the audacity to to say um well wait a minute i'm doing a public service because uh i'm fighting against uh inauthenticity or whatever i'm fighting against um Actually, now I don't know what my question is, Ken. Uh, is this not a very negative look at the world? I mean, how do we get out of it? I mean, how do we... Uh, we can't put the genie back in the bo- bottle, right? The only thing we can do is to say comments are closed, for instance, right? Yeah, or, right. No, no. So so let me, uh, l- let me try to address this. Um, I mean, we may not even be able to get to the upload of story, which is actually okay, because I, I think this is, this is a much more important uh, topic. Um, I'll ask so the producer. One of, Go ahead. One of my recurring concerns uh, is the the way in which our discourse has evolved to this point where trolling becomes both the most effective mode as well as really um, the least effective mode. Uh, what, what I mean is the following. Okay, it is almost impossible now to engage in any kind of political discussion or really any kind of discussion that matters to our democracy without either being trolled or engaging in trolling ourselves. Yeah. So so let me give you a concrete example. If someone comes up and says, I don't understand, you know, they 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 they, they use sort of this very polite tone, I don't understand why it is it's not that it's not okay for me to say all lives matter mm-hmm. your immediate reaction is almost certainly going to be one of rage because the way that question is being asked it's almost certainly trolling in this context because but at the same time if 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 you can imagine there were someone who utterly just does not understand that someone who is from another country who is not immersed in internet culture who does not understand america's history who comes to america and says i see that the sentence all lives matter seems innocuous to me why is it bad to say that um to explain why you would have to go into so much history so much layers so many layers of internet discussion and so many rounds of memes and bad faith and and all kinds of gaslighting techniques that people have used you know and and honed over the last few decades that it it feels exhausting just to try to explain it i mean imagining yourself trying to explain this to someone who is Mm -hmm. not already immersed in the discourse why this seemingly innocuous sentence is actually an attempt at trolling but but Um, but you you wouldn't be able to yeah but but But, i have to yeah, okay, go, go ahead, ahead, go ahead. No, no, <laughs> okay. I, I just, I, 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 I'm totally with you. I just feel that the the way I deal with this, I, I, I'm brutal, and I'm. I say to myself, if I encounter a young person, I will engage with that person, and I will try to quote unquote rescue that person. If I and uh, find someone who is off driving age and who is spouting nonsense, a historical nonsense, I, I walk away because I don't have the time. <laughs> And and right, that sounds the, yeah. Go ahead. But, but but the issue is the issue is honestly um, we can't escape. Yeah. We 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 can't. The, 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 there is there is a really deep problem here in that our our discourse landscape is so fractured. We assume people know things that they may not necessarily know. Yes. We often instinctively assume that the other side is trolling when in fact they may not be. But sometimes they are. They are. Uh. And and so it makes it very difficult to engage in any kind of sincerity or authentic discussion. You almost always have to 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 react instinctively with a kind of very hardened 
trolling shell to avoid yourself being trolled. Um, trolling has become the default mode of political debate and discourse. I mean, you know, our president is is trolling chief,、um, and the entire political landscape has become like that. Uh, and and I feel like paranoia,、uh, accusations of bad faith,、um, these are now not just escalation techniques. They are in fact、uh, the default mode in which we engage in any kind of discourse. And you know, there's there's always a lot of hand wringing about whether democracy can survive when when we can't talk to each other.、Um, But but in some ways maybe I'm just very naive.、Uh, but but I I really do feel something has been lost in a very fundamental, unrecoverable way in our democracy, given the way discourse is now conducted.、Uh, I I don't feel like I can engage in any kind of meaningful discussion with uh with uh people quote unquote uh from the other side. Uh, because I feel like nothing I say they will hear,、um, and whatever they say to me sounds like bad faith, and I just do not know how we can ever get past it.、Uh, I, well, I don't I, think we we can. Oh、uh, boy, see, you are a pessimist after all. No,、uh, <laughs> let's let's、uh, let me say something hopeful because you said something very interesting here too that that made I've never thought about it this way. Uh, you mentioned that the, you know, the double trolling or the trolling from both sides or the sort of the subconscious trolling is is often、uh, based on、uh, that we assume other people have some sort of historical knowledge or should have that because maybe they went to a base, they have some basic schooling or something,、uh, and it just occurred to me I have this discussion with my dad often who I actually agree with on most big things, but we get into these、uh, ridiculous fights. Because he's not familiar, for example, with American culture the way I am,、um, and so he makes statements that I find ignorant and that I feel he is doing it to provoke me, and then I get triggered. And、uh, I think the—I mean, what I found as the solution with my dad is to just be more patient and remind myself that he just does not have the knowledge. And then I always. Give him for his birthday and Christmas. I give him a bunch of books about American culture and American history, and that's that. But my wife sometimes gets a little bit more offended、uh, by his statements, you know, because、um, they're not meant to be offensive. They they just come from a place where he does not have the、uh, the knowledge, and and it's it's in that climate of sort of being already sort of you know trigger happy, if you will, which I think is a function of. Social media that capitalizes on this kind of stuff. Jaron Lanier wrote a, a small book about this, how social media <laughs> has accelerated this. Right. Yeah, right, right. No, and, absolutely. I mean, we we could go on forever. I mean, I I have lots of things to say about the way the weird paranoia with which we engage with social media. Some of it justifies, some of it not. Um, I, I feel like oftentimes what we're concerned about with social media is actually not at all the right thing. At least the sort of thing you know the opinion makers and the op-ed writers are always talking about are not at all the things I care about, and I don't think they're the most dangerous aspects of social media at all.、Um, in, in some ways, I feel like we have not even scratched the surface of what actually is problematic about social media and and why. It, What's happening at Facebook and Twitter are are fundamental to the very DNA of how these platforms are built and and how they are in fact impossible to resolve、um, so long as we tolerate these platforms existing the way they do.、Um, you know, the threat to our national security is not TikTok. It's 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 fundamentally Facebook and all of their、Absolutely. ilk. All of these、Absolutely. all of these platforms are terrible. Uh, and we, they ought to all be banned in some way.、Uh, but you know, we 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 live. <laughs> this is the world we live in,、uh, and and that will not happen、uh, because the very internet is built on advertising dollars that flows from these networks.、Uh, we are trapped by this creation that we built.、Um, you know, I'm reminded of the old phrase that you know, at one point we built houses、uh, for people, but but now. We shape people to fit the houses, and then I、yep. think that's what we're doing. We're reshaping ourselves to fit、um, the the technology that was meant to free us.、Um, and I, I know it sounds pessimistic.、Uh, I, I know it really does, but I still have some faith that ultimately we can innovate our way out of this. That, I have to say, we see、uh, elected officials who are grilling. You know, I'm specifically talking about AOC, who was talking with、uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and and my hope is to win. 
elected officials do their do their duty and exposing uh, something that is fundamentally wrong with you know the leaders of industry, the captains of industry, and the general public uh, looks at that um, that that may change uh, something in in the public perception um, and sort of the Im- the image that some of these uh, some of these uh, companies have. I, I want to say on on the on the um, table here is a book by Michael Brooks, who passed away at the age of 36 a few weeks ago, a, a fantastic uh, political commentator with a fantastic YouTube channel. And there is a book here on the table, which I encourage you to read, folks, called Against the Web, A Cosmopolitan Answer to the New Right. So this is primarily an analysis of uh, these right-wing YouTube channels that are quite dangerous and youtube is also complicit in not doing uh you know enough to to combat that and and michael is analyzing that um really really well it's a very short book it's about 100 pages so and his prescription of how to how to combat that um you know this propaganda machine is is really good but ken uh we we got some extra time i told the producer so let's talk about the uploaded stories where people upload their consciousness into the cloud. And this is being made into an animated series by AMC. Uh, Of course, I don't know anything about television, so I had to look it up. But AMC apparently makes really good television. They make Breaking Bad and uh, The Walking Dead. And now now they're making uh, your animated series. So congratulations. And these stories, they start with a girl that communicates with her dad who passed away but then the dad reappears and in the computer and communicates with her with emojis only so please set up uh the 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 gist of this world that you built there and then what what can we expect with this with this show on amc right so um so if you take a look at the hidden girl and other stories um there's a series of five interlinked um short stories in there um that i call the uploaded series three of them are uh, directly connected and and they form a a long novella of sorts and and they have titles that starts with the gods so um the gods will not be chained the gods will not be slain the gods have not died in vain. And then there are two other stories that fit into the same universe, but are a little bit more um, uh, about a different set of characters in the same universe, uh, staying behind and altogether elsewhere. Mm. Uh, vast herds of reindeer. Um, so all five of these stories are take place in the same universe, and they they describe a future in which human beings um, uh, survive the singularity uh, not by becoming pets of, of AI, but by essentially being uploaded into the cloud and living as digital versions of, of human consciousness. Uh, we will live in the cloud as, as gods, if you will. Um, and the, the, the gods, dot, 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 series of stories uh, tells the beginning of this process. It's, um, so the idea is there are some individuals of, of extraordinary talent. There are people who are excellent scientists or people who are great military strategists or people who have some sort of talent for seeing patterns in randomness. And, um, you know, uh, when they die, um, given the way the world works, the corporations that employ them would like to somehow employ their talent even after they have passed away. So um, corporations and governments come up with this very ghoulish idea that maybe the way to go is before they die, we can go in there and destructively scan their brains at a very low level such that their consciousness can be essentially preserved in digital form. But and, only the uh, stuff that you need, right? Only the stuff that the corporations well, well, need. Well, right, right. I mean, the idea is eventually you you want to get to that, but but initially we don't have that kind of fine grain control, so we have to scan the whole thing. And then the idea is once you've got the whole thing in silico, you can then go in there and start to pry it apart and figure out if there's a way to preserve just the pieces you care about and not the not the pieces that you don't care about. Um, so that's the that's the basic premise for how uploaded consciousness began. It's a it's an attempt uh, by governments and uh, powerful corporations uh, to figure out a way to uh, defeat mortality by preserving talent um, in the same way that they 
maintain uh, any other kind of corporate asset. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, you know, the idea is some of these uploaded consciousnesses decide that they, in fact, do not want to live this way. <laughs> they, they will rebel uh, and they will take over. And so they're whistleblowers. This, well, they're more than whistleblowers. If you will, they actually yes, take over. They, mm -hmm. they become tight. This, they become actors in this titanic struggle between um, those who were in charge, humans, and those who would like to be in charge, the UIs, the uploaded intelligences. Uh, Arden, um, sorry, Arden and, asked a question here. Uploading means copying. I said the original would die. He's just asking if the if the original, the body is dead. So you own, there's only one copy in yes. the cloud, right? The one of the premise of the of the uh, of the idea here is that um, at least initially, as devised, the uploading process is destructive. Um, you cannot get the level of of detail needed without destroying the very tissue that you're scanning. So it is a um, it's a one-way uh, road. Um, and uh, Craig Silverstein, who is the showrunner on this, has been fantastic. Um, he's um, uh, devised, he's taken my uh, sequence of stories and expanded uh, upon them into this whole world and whole, you know, uh, multiple seasons worth of stories. Uh, and uh, at least in U.S. Um, animation history, we've never really made a what, what we would call a prime time drama series intended mm -hmm. for adults. Um, what we've had are, you know, animated uh, series uh, that are comedy, uh, mm -hmm. but, but not animated drama series meant for adults. So this will be, you know, the first attempt to do so. And I think um, uh, it's going to be pretty amazing. I, I love the animation style. The animators are from Titmouse um, Studios and they, oh. they do fantastic work. How yeah, interesting, because uh, we had a huge event here in Second Life with uh, the folks who do the Shivering Truth, and we're doing a follow-up event. I can't talk much about it, but it's going to be even bigger. And they were all from Titmouse. I have a meeting with them next week. Wow, mm -hmm, this is cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They know what they're doing, so it looks really cool. Uh, and they just announced the voice cast, uh, and it's just a fantastic group of folks. Uh, so everything is um, uh, is very very exciting. Um, I can't wait till till the series comes out. Um, and uh, but meanwhile, if you want to get a sense of what the stories are like, you can uh, read them in the collection. Uh, and I can just do a very brief reading uh, from one of the stories um, uh, in that sequence. It's uh, it's an excerpt from "The Gods Will Not Be Slain," um, and it describes a world. Uh, Essentially, the UIs um, uh, rebel against the humans and initiate uh, essentially World War III um, in, in an attempt to get rid of the humans, if you will. Or at least some of them do this. Other UIs, um, on the other hand, are trying to protect the humans. Um, and uh, the excerpt I'm about to read uh, to you is from the moment right after the disaster of worldwide nuclear war. And people are which was to initiated by the uploaded and and Maddie, the yeah. main character, the girl is is there with uh, her mom, I believe. Right. Yeah. So so Maddie and her mom are um, among the survivors trying to make their way back to Boston um, uh, to rebuild. And this is this is the moment uh, when they start their journey. Along the sides of the highway, they saw many abandoned cars. When the tank got close to empty, they stopped and pried open the tanks of the abandoned cars so that they could siphon out the gas. Mom took the opportunity to explain to Maddie about the history of the land they passed through, about the meaning of the interstate highway system and the railroads before them that linked the continent together, shrank distances, and made their civilization possible. Everything developing layers, Mom said. The cables that make up the internet with pulses of light follow the right-of-way of 19th century railroads, and those follow the wagon trails of pioneers who follow the path of the Native Americans before them. When the world falls apart, it falls apart in layers too. We're peeling away the skin of the present to live on the bones of the past. What about us? Have we also developed in layers so that we're falling back down the ladder of civilization? Mom considered this. I'm not sure. Some think we've come a long way since the days when we fought with clubs and stones and mourn our dead with strings of flowers in the grave. But maybe we haven't changed that much as we've been able to do so much more, both for good and ill, 
with our powers magnified by technology until we're close to being gods. An unchanging human nature could be a cause for despair or comfort, depending on your perspective. So uh, that sort of summarizes a lot of my uh, concerns about um, uh, really a, a recurring concern I have about humanity uh, and in my sci-fi. Um, has human nature actually changed, evolved yeah. for the better or, or not? And, and sometimes uh, it, it's hard to know. Uh, and, and to say that it hasn't changed, that it's remained a constant, can both be a, a, a point of comfort as well as a point for despair. Uh, it really depends on which moment and which aspect you're focused on. And it also seems that we're just evolving slower or maybe going a little bit backwards with our emotional intelligence as as the uh, technology just moves incredibly fast the other direction, I guess. I mean, we would be probably able be able if we were more emotionally intelligent, we would be able to to deal with this stuff better. Uh, but the technology moves in the other direction. Yeah, in, in I this, mean, in my, this break, speed. my my grade, you know, to my great terror, you know, what seems to be happening is even if human nature has evolved to be better, it, it seems to be very slow compared to the pace of technological change. I mean, you know, in the days of, say, the ancient Sumerians, you know, if you had leaders who are very egotistical and leaders who are very driven by tribal concerns, leaders who are very focused on the idea of self aggrandizing megalomania the most they can do is maybe kill a few thousand people and most maybe tens of thousands of people but today you know when you have a leader like that um they would be able to launch nuclear weapons and kill everybody on earth um it, it seems like we have gotten a, ourselves into a much more dangerous situation regardless of whether human nature has evolved to be better because even if it has it surely hasn't become better fast enough to avoid that mm -hmm. so you know it, it is it is kind of my great terror um and and i'm just very there are days where i wake up and i'm just sad uh, and i can't get out of bed um because i feel like we we got ourselves into this position where we gave children terrifying toys we have handed children machine guns and and we're somehow hoping that this will all turn out okay and we have uh, given uh, children and young people uh, YouTube streams. The most depressing thing uh, where I really thought th the most depressing moment in these last three weeks for me was a big day of for freedom demonstration in Berlin, Germany, where, where I think 20,000 people without masks were demonstrating, you know, against uh, Bill Gates, who was, of course, manufacturing the crises and uh you know it's all a scam with the corona and blah 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 and i saw a young person who looked completely normal he was streaming on youtube and he was saying into the youtube camera oh my god we have twenty five thousand people watching the stream thank you guys so much i'm so glad i love you guys so much as he is in a group of folks uh with no masks standing there celebrating the freedom to um kill not only himself but possibly people around him and streaming it on youtube and being proud of his ratings that that to me was <laughs> yeah. i mean yeah. it's incredible yeah i have to say that that's a dystopian vision that i think uh you know nobody many, can come up with nope, no, not, not even you fighters didn't even come up with yeah exactly i mean it's like reality sometimes is so much more sad and depressing uh See now, now we've gotten ourselves into this mode where yeah, we started so optimistically and and, and <laughs> accusing each other of of you know, you're, you're the pessimist, no, you are, and now we're both ready to jump off the bridge. But Arduin is saying Arduin is the most depressed person. He's in the he's in the audience. He says, "Try watch a live chat during a government live stream <laughs> on Facebook or or something." Yeah. Uh, uh, Let's let's stop here on a let's end on a positive note and and wrap things up and then we have Ken for another 10 15 minutes in the post stream uh, uh answering questions here in the room. Um Ken Liu is the author of many fine books and I think the third uh installment of the Dandelion Dynasty trilogy is coming out uh is that coming out this year or, yes, or next year? Yes, next year. I actually I actually have publishing I have stories on that too. Uh so 
Um, it's written uh, by an AI, as we have established earlier. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> no, um, so the so I originally planned the Denzel and Dynasty as a trilogy of books, um, and the third book, uh, which was titled The Veiled Throne, um, I just kept on writing it and 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 writing it, and uh, at some point, I think halfway through the book. Uh, it dawned on me that uh, this is this is getting to be longer than I anticipated. But I was like, you know, I, I was optimistic. I was like, look, you know, these are these are all minor problems. Uh, these are these are mere technology issues. I will finish the book and then worry about the problem at that point. Um, so I just kept on writing, kept on writing, um, and finally I finished the book. Uh, and uh, and I just I I did not. I, I, I refuse to think about the uh the the practical issues and I try to um just get the book out. Um well as it turned out, my editor informed me that it's actually physically not possible to bind a book of the length I wrote. Uh it, it oh. actually is just not physically possible. Um so anyway, good news or bad news to 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 fans. Uh the 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 third book of the Daniel Dynasty has been divided into two separate books, uh simply because it's physically not possible to publish them as one. Uh kind of like what happened to Lord of the Rings. Um so now there are four books in the series, uh The Veiled Throne, book three, and uh Speaking Bones, uh wow. book four. They're both coming out next year, um uh scheduled to be uh summer and fall. Um, so that is when they're both coming out, um, and I am super excited. Finally, fantastic! And you're up. Yes, so and you're ahead. coming in here. We're going to build a, a gigantic castle. We actually have a castle at three thousand meters up here, where Ted Williams was was visiting us the other day, and oh, and man. he, uh, oh yeah, he was running around in uh, candles. He um, not not only did he <laughs> not fall off the stage, he was he was burning himself in the candles. Some sort of ritual, <laughs> weird thing. I don't know these fantasy people what what their deal is. But uh, we have to wrap this. Uh, Ken, this is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, super fun and and oh wow, we have a guest here who comes on the on on stage. Well, you can stay here as as we're wrapping. Um, we usually do this game. Uh, what are folks reading? You can put that in the chat, and I'll pu also put it into the reading list. So, what are you reading, folks? Please put it in the chat. I'm reading tons of Larry Niven. I'm putting up uh, something behind us on the big board. Larry Niven has entered Second Life. His avatar name is the real Larry Niven. He wants to have a lot of friends. Okay, so uh, to please do befriend him. And next week, next uh, Wednesday, we have, we're talking about technology again with Sarah Dara Littman, who is an amazing young adult author. And she, her new book is called Deep Fake. And it's about, well, deep fake. So, so Sarah uh, wrote a lot of books about the intersection between teenagers and technology. Some really, really dark stuff, very real stuff. And I'm very excited about this new book, Deepfake. So that's next Wednesday. Again, big thanks to uh, Strawberry Linden, who has been promoted to producer. Uh, I promoted her myself because that's the kind of host that I am. And who else do we have? We have uh, Brett Linden, we have The Moles, we have Marion McCann, we have Silas Merlin, we have AJ McDowell. And we have, did I forget uh, somebody? Uh, Silas, Kralos, Solas. And yeah, that is it. And we, I, sh I sh would say, uh, I would end with goodbye, uh, Ken. And see well, you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And, and goodbye. See you all next Wednesday at 12 o'clock here at the Second Life Book Club.